sacrifice time from hobbies and families uh, to join us. Uh, we're really glad to have you. We love hosting these. We think it's super fun. Uh, everyone plug your ears. I gotta shut the garage because the music is super annoying. <laughs> To anyone that wants to say they're hiring or anything else, we when we're smaller, we do introductions. When we're this big, we don't. So, um, if anyone wants anything to say anything, just raise your hand. I'll call on you, and you can let the group know that you want to hire GoDevs or whatever it is. Anybody? Or not? Or not? <laughs> hiring? We're always hiring. Amazon's hiring. Big Amazon's hiring. <laughs> Mariah's like 12 years, she's going to work here soon. <laughs> hey, I'm a commodity now, I'm famous. <laughs> she was on the news the other day for running the, the Women Who Go workshop, or the Women Who Go meetup. So. Um, okay, if no one has anything, then we'll. Oh, oh here we go. Sorry. I, I wasn't making a joke. Oh, okay, go. <laughs> I can't tell if she's serious anymore. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm from Philpac. Uh, we are an Amazon subsidiary, and we are hiring a senior uh, software engineer. We are doing billing and AWS serverless and EJS for Amazon.com. Nice. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. I know hey. you do. It's that time of year. It's that time of year. I'm back again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're having our Salt Lake City DevOps Days again this year, May 14th and 15th at the NOAA's uh, event center there between 106 and 118th. Um, how many, how many of y'all are, have ever worked your butt off, been beat up, got something ready to go, and it sat there for six months because management or the business didn't want to use it? They beat you all to hell and wanted to be done. How many? We all yeah. How many of y'all have heard the term DevOps? Nope. How many of y'all have heard DevSecOps? Nope. Okay. Big buzzword. The new one now is BizOps because it takes a lot more than just the devs and the ops to get stuff out. It takes management, it takes a lot of support. Next year it's just ops. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, Salt Lake City DevOps Days .org. The list of the speakers going up. Uh, I have for anyone who wants it. I've got these are stickers, but they have a discount code on the back. So you get a discount on um, a ticket to go. We sold out every year, so yeah. Make sure you go on. Who wants? You want to just pass them around here? He doesn't get paid. No. I still don't know why he does it. I ask him every yeah. day. Yeah. Why not? He's a volunteer. Soliciting. Just take him just pass some conference. That's one day. You don't want to do it. I know what it is. That's why I think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> At least make some money, but then you can't present here. Just make money because we don't do sponsors. Anyone else? Our, right here. Our, our non-go non jobs. Uh, Absolutely. You can advertise non-go jobs. Yeah. So I work at a company called CHG. They're off of 7200 South in Midville. And uh, we are hiring quite a few developers, mostly Node and just JavaScript developers. We yeah. work with Node and AWS and Vue. <laughs> Yeah, if you're a JavaScript developer or have that experience, I think it would be a You, you hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, not, we're not writing in Go yet. So. Yeah, that's in the trough of despair right now. I'm sure. uh, Shane, go ahead. 
I'm Shane Hansen. Uh, I work for Walmart e-commerce. We are a uh, fully remote team. Uh, I think it's about 50 of us now, although we now have almost about a dozen in Utah. Um, we're hiring about half a dozen Go developers. You're a dozen in Utah now? You have 12? Good job, Shane. Wow. Way to be <laughs> Right. Cheap recruiter right there. Yeah, I mean, if you are interested in CDNs, proxies, caching, edge compute, image optimization, um, uh, just uh, give me a ring after this. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Nate Myers with Newbie, right there. It was a very long walk to get here. Um, we're looking for two or three Go devs, I think. If you want to ask me about this after, I still think Newbie has the most interesting technical problems in the state. Nice. Just saying. Yeah. Is there someone else? One more hand over here that I saw. <coughs> no? Oh, I have a thing. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So next month we're having a Go workshop here. A beginning intro to go workshop and an intermediate level. <coughs> intermediate is supposed to be my level of go, so if you know how well I do go, you can kind of read what I'm saying about being beginner and intermediate. Uh, they're the 13th and the 21st of April. If you're interested in signing up, just talk to me. We've got some good, talented people giving them. So. Oh, and they'll be, did I say they would be here? They're going to be here. Perfect. Clint's paying for food. Yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> I just let Mariah do whatever she wants. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was doing this, John. Oh, you're doing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is there anybody else? Last thing I'll say then is we, we run a couple of different meetups here. Mariah is actually in charge of now the Utah Mach Machine Learning Utah meetup that we do here every month. Yeah, and she's got a great line. Her next three speakers are great. Lineup. Next, this month is uh, Starcraft. Starcraft AI. It's Starcraft, which I'm super excited for. Um, that's a super on the 26th awesome. here. Can't wait to automate Starcraft with an AI bot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not be a nerd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Without further ado, we'd like to turn the time over to Brent. Uh, from NAV. We really appreciate him coming, uh, taking time out for this presentation. For those that don't know, if you present this, <clears throat> if you present this meetup, you get the uh, speaker kit, which is a t-shirt from stickers for you to go. And the prize possession, this is in the back, is the Utah Go presenter pit. <laughs> These are under lock and key. You cannot have these unless you present. You may get a t-shirt, you may get a sticker. In fact, I'll go with the stickers. But you will never get one of these unless you present. <laughs> well, I'll turn these over to you. Thank you for speaking. Don't forget it, it's right there. <laughs> will you just see it? I'm gonna add to the who's hiring that NAV is among them. And we're looking for one Go developer to join our team that builds the enterprise API is using this GraphQL stuff I'm going to show today. Uh, talks titled GraphQL and Go, there's really three parts. First being GraphQL in general. The second, a dive into one particular framework for implementing it. And then third, how to use reflection or some tools we've, that are reflection based that we're using to make that framework suck a little bit less. <laughs> Yay, suck it too. Exactly. About me, an engineering manager at NAV. Um, you know Mariah, she used to work there. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> for helping make her what she is, I'm saying. It's all great. Give him the credit for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been doing GraphQL a few years. Used to be in Python, now in Go for the last year or so. I expect the people in this room have a pretty wide range of experience with GraphQL. Some of you have been doing it, you've just like got it down, and some like, I've heard the other word, <laughs> GraphQL. So there is a range there. And I'm going to try and explain the basics enough for the people brand new to it while not boring the people who have had some more experience with it. Wish me luck. Setting the stage for GraphQL, I think best starts with REST APIs. And 
most of us have probably built one of those. The basic pattern is illustrated in this slide where you have a concept of a resource and there's basically five verbs you can do with that resource. You can list them, create them, delete them, update them, and just get a specific one. It's all built around certain patterns in URLs. You can't see my cursor, but I'm highlighting the left side. <laughs> and HTTP methods you do on those specific URLs. Some things it doesn't specify. It doesn't tell you what your payload's gonna look like. It doesn't tell you what kind of payload you need to provide if you wanna create a new instance of a resource. There are some specs out there, probably have heard of Swagger or OpenAPI or JSON API that try to address this with mixed results. Some people have built some great tooling and to get to a good place. Most companies I've seen have not really a REST, but a REST-ish API. <laughs> and it's the result of a lot of conversations between front-end devs and back-end devs. It goes something like, front-ender says, hey, that's great, you showed me all the posts, but I'm having to fetch, do a new request for every one of the comments. Can you just put the comments in there? And the back-ender will say like, oh, that's not gonna follow like our RESTful pure patterns. We're gonna be compromising on like the API spec there. Who wins that argument is gonna depend on what company you're at and who the people are. But over time, APIs that began with good RESTful intentions tend to evolve away from them to solve real business cases. Some of those problems are what's being addressed with GraphQL. The biggest shift is you start by saying, I have specific types that this API will return. I have specific types you need to provide me if you're doing different calls. All of that gets declared in a schema that is served along with the API. So tooling can go grab it, do introspection and say, here's all the stuff the API does. And if you like using Go, which is statically typed and a lot supports awesome tooling, it's a similar change over on the API side. Now the API declares what all its types are, what all different fields need. You can build cool tooling on that. We'll show some of that. Also GraphQL supports requesting multiple fields at the same time. So in that example I gave where maybe you're fetching a blog post and you also wanna get the comments to show at the bottom, it's trivially easy and just built into the way GraphQL works. It's not that kind of negotiation that you'd have between the backender and the frontender in like a RESTful API. There's a few different ways to query a GraphQL API. Three, actually. The most simple is you put the query in the query string of your HTTP request. All these curly braces, the quoting, all of that is just part of the GraphQL query <coughs> specification. And the data comes back in an object called data. As I ask for a field called user in the query itself, I get inside data, there's a user. And I said inside the user, I want a name. So there's a mirroring between what I asked for in the request, this nested structure, and what I get back in the response. It exactly matches the same nested structure. You can also query it by doing a post of that same query body, but in the payload of your post. And if you specify this content type application GraphQL, you should get the exact same behavior. This can be useful when your queries get really big. There's a limit to how big a URL can be and all of the proxies in the middle still pass all of that stuff along in the query string. So when your queries get big and they can, with GraphQL, you can post them instead. And then the final way, probably the most common for like automated client libraries, is actually just post a JSON body. One of the fields in the body is query that matches what we've seen before. But then there can be additional fields. Here, this top example, you see a query.json where we've got the query field. Below it, we've got a variables field. And you can do substitutions, reuse a variable value in several parts of the query. Uh, regardless of which way you query it, any of these three should be equivalent and you get back the same result. In Go, there are at least this many implementations of frameworks to help you build up a GraphQL server. 
I have only used one of them. Uh, so I'm not in this talk making claims about which one is best. But there are, is one main philosophical difference between these ones in the list. Some are purely like you build up the structure, all your schema stuff in memory when your app is running and just gets served out. Others try to make life easier, have less boilerplate by doing some code generation for you. So the Samsara one there and the bottom one, GQL Gen, was both code gen based <coughs> QL APIs. I might play with them sometime, I haven't yet. The one I've used the most is this top one, GraphQL Go slash GraphQL. What I can tell, it's the most popular, the oldest one. It supports the whole GraphQL spec very clearly, like if you've learned GraphQL anywhere else, the concepts that it presents you just use the same terminology that you would have seen in a JS library. I see a hand. Whole spec? Like the spec compliant, like complete? Yeah. The spec is pretty simple, so that's not a huge lift. But as soon as you start abstracting stuff to make life easier for the Go dev, you might make comments and saying, okay, we made this really easy. This other thing you don't even know how to do yet. Um, that's the kind of trade offs I expect to see in some of the other frameworks that do a little more syntactic sugar. But I want to show you next an example of just using that GraphQL Go library without anything else. And then talk about some problems. So here we are. This main.go is a complete GraphQL server. <coughs> I mentioned we were going to have a schema. So it embodies that concept here. That's all new schema. In GraphQL, every schema can have three top-level objects. A top-level query thing, can have lots of different fields in it. Top-level mutation thing, which is where you put anything that causes side effects. So create a user, update a user, that kind of stuff. And then the third concept that it exposes at the top level is called a subscription. And the GraphQL spec doesn't have nearly as much to say about subscriptions as it does about queries and mutations. And I'm not doing an example here. They tend to be more rare in the wild. Um, each field, okay, so just drilling down here, I've got a schema. Inside that is my top level query thing. Inside that, I've just got one field in this API and that's let's get a user. It's going to return a user type it's defined further down the the page, it's going to require an argument called ID that is a string. All of this gets passed all the way out to the front end, and we'll see what it looks like to say your JavaScript dev in a minute. Also going to declare one mutation. It's going to be for save user, which is both for creates and updates. It still returns the same user type. <coughs> And it's going to take in more arguments, an ID, a name. Imagine this is like a bit angel kind of thing. We've got a number of children. We've got favorite movies. Mostly doing this to illustrate some different types. So one of this, these is an integer. One of these is a list of strings. So all that very strict typing gets expressed all the way to the front end. Um, I said we were going to return a user type. Highlighting, yeah. And he's declared down here. Again, we're using the GraphQL Go library. We're going to say a user type has fields for ID, name, joined at, number of children, etc. You'll notice this concept of types that have fields is repeated. So up here, I have a type user. Also, no, even further up. Query is my top level type. It has fields. One of those fields is user. That returns a user type. User type has more fields. They have types. So the graph in GraphQL comes from that concept that it is really fields nested in types as deeply as you want to go. So the way you express relationships is just through that nesting. <coughs> There's also in each of these top level things, this resolve thing. GraphQL concept you'll see in any of the libraries that implement it is the idea of a resolver. Any field in that tree 
as a function that goes to get the data that that field should be able to receive. <coughs> so in this case, it's resolve user. That function down here, say we've got to get past this thing from the framework. It gives us an arg, so we got to go like fetch that out of the map and make sure it's the type that we expect it really is true. If not, we error out. If it is, then we're going to go, in this case, all our data just lives here at the bottom. We just have an in-memory data store. Uh, so when we fetch a user, it comes out of this map and create one, we stick it in there. So in real life, you'd have a database or something that's your back end. There's also a resolver for the save user mutation. So that function down here in the same file, it takes in a bunch more arguments, all of those things that you can provide on a user. At the end, both of them return this user struct, which you'll see up here. That being said, I'm gonna run this example and show you what the front end stuff looks like. Row gun, go run. So that's running now. Let's just browse to localhost. Try our luck. Cool. So where all this website stuff come from? This is a tool called Graphical. It is released pretty sure by the same authors who created GraphQL in the first place. So I kind of double checked that. When I set up the GraphQL Go framework, I said, turn on GraphQL, because I want to show that. If you set that to false, you wouldn't get this page. But this tool, it's got these three panes. Over here, I write queries. Here, I get responses. If you've used Postman or something like that in the past, it's a very similar concept. This is GraphQL aware. So that means over here on the right, it went out and it talked to my API. It said, what types, what fields do you expose? I'm gonna show those in the documentation viewer. So we got that here. It said our top level query type is just called query. <coughs> into that, query has one field on it. It's called user. He returns a user. You click into the user, you can see these are all the fields on user. These are what their types are. So this is all built from those maps of structs that we saw over in the Go file. And if I want to query it, I can write the word query here. They give me a user, what's happening? As I type, it's got all this cool autocomplete because it was able to introspect my schema. That's the kind of tooling you can get. A lot harder to get that with the REST API. I don't know of anything that would do that. So I wanna get the user named Bob and I wanna know his name I want to know his number of children. I want to know his favorite movies. And you hit play. Bob is named Bob Blah Blah. His number of children is seven, and his favorite movies are The Shawshank Redemption and Weekend at Bernie's too. I want to show you another tool. This is Insomnia. It was called that because it started out with rest clients who get like rest, can't sleep. <laughs> it added really cool GraphQL support. So when you come in here and you define <laughs> request, you can say it's going to be a GraphQL type. And it's going to do a similar thing that GraphQL did. It's going to query your API and give you like autocomplete. So here's that same user thing. If I start typing favorite movies, it's going to say, hey, I can complete that for you. And I send that over it's going to run the same request, get the same result. We had a mutation in our schema as well for saving a user. I want to make a second one. Let's say, let's have a new user. His name will be Joe. His name will be Joe Schmo. He has 19 kids. Good going, Joe. And his favorite movie is Pitch Perfect 3. That's creative. So that went out. Framework called our resolver, passed up that data parsed it out, made a new user, stuck him in the map, and now we go back to get user, <clears throat> Joe instead of Bob. All his data's in there. I promised that we could query multiple fields at a time, so I'm gonna 
show what that looks like now. We've got a couple of users in our API. We can ask for this user field twice, but to avoid a name collision, we've got to alias it. So we're going to call this one Bob. We're going to call this one Joe. That name could be anything. It doesn't have to match these IDs. It just happens to. So when I send that in, I get two things back. The captain and the JSON response, Bob, matches this alias that I provided over to you. So you can imagine a, like the Facebook case, because they invented GraphQL, if I want to go get somebody and their friends or their mom, you, the front end developer can design a query to get exactly the data they need, and it's one round trip. So it's not a whole bunch of hammering the API and wasting a bunch of time. This points to why GraphQL doesn't use the URL patterns that you used to in REST. What would be the URL for get me Bob and Joe? It doesn't translate over to this world. So you see that my URL that I'm hitting is always just the slash GraphQL route. There's one URL I'm doing all of this stuff at because the REST style route wouldn't make sense. I could add a third person here. So let's say this is Larry. And I'm going to ask for an ID of Larry. We haven't saved a Larry yet. Larry's new. Let's just get Larry's name. I asked for that. <coughs> of course, he can't fulfill it. There is no Larry. It still gives me Bob and Joe. Larry ends up null. And instead, we get this new errors thing that's saying we couldn't find a Larry. This points to another big difference. If you're used to a REST API, HTTP status codes are not really going to help you anymore because you normally, if there's something that's missing, you turn a 404, right? What if two thirds of what you asked for is there and one third is missing? You can't return two thirds of 404. It's not going to have the same meaning. It's 404. <laughs> <laughs> they might. Not <laughs> <laughs> so this, even though the error, see there's a 200 up there. Uh, so if you are used to, you know, you check the response status code, that can always tell you when you have an error. You need to unlearn that instinct when you start writing GraphQL clients. And instead, you check for this errors object on every request. And your request might have partially succeeded and partially failed. Yeah? I noticed that the errors is an array. Mm -hmm. So we can add, I don't know, we add another person who doesn't exist. What's your name? John. <laughs> ID. John. You're John now. <laughs> Send that. Each resolver is run independently and can return its own error. Uh, so let's talk about what we don't like about what we've seen so far. So one thing right here on the page that's bothering me is the fact that this timestamp came through kind of ugly. This is just a go time dot time that's been stringified. It hasn't been cast or serialized into a nice ISO 8601 date time like most APIs you're used to would have. That's one thing I don't like. Another thing I don't like, we've got this struct here that's returned by our resolvers, and it's got these five fields on it. We have to separately tell GraphQL that we have these five fields. In this case, very small API, just one type in it, probably okay. As your API grows, you've got dozens of fields, each of those having dozens of fields. This code grows to pages and pages. And at that point, it's super easy for that object you're building here to get out of sync with that thing there. The framework is it doesn't have your back there. If you mess that up, I hope your unit tests catch it. <laughs> that's all you got. Yeah. All you're doing here is building a map. Fields is just an alias for a map from strings to their field type, right? So the compiler doesn't care as long as you have a valid map here. Those names all mismatch, Tyler's not going to catch it. All of this is runtime evaluation. So I don't love that. Similarly, down here, yeah. Um, quick question, since you addressed it, 
uh, how do you deal with sync issues? I'm assuming you've run into similar. <coughs> that comes later in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We're going to get there. Um, I'm talking about these things I hate because we're going to try and fix them. Um, here in this resolve save user, way up top, we declare that this mutation takes in these four arguments, ID, name, number of children, favorite movies. Down here, we have to write an if statement for every single one. Again, very easy for that schema declaration to get out of sync with the code here. Um, we could have typos in the map names. We could forget a thing on either side. There's no guarantee that we're in sync. I don't love that, that's brittle. That's another thing we want to fix. Let's go back to Keynote, and we'll march on on how to fix these things. Where am I at? I'm just gonna leave this down here. We talked about all of these problems. Yeah. Our, the tool in our toolbox to solve this is gonna be reflection, and we should at least ask ourselves before we reach for that tool, is this the right time? I think in this case, it is. Rob Pike says, always be clear when you can. Reflection is never clear, so think twice. But there's a time and a place, and I think this is one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but what reflection is gonna allow us to do is take that repetition and possibilities of getting out of sync yeah. and build our own framework on top that can provide us some of those guarantees that we don't yet have. So build your own framework is what that acronym <laughs> comes out to. Um, at this URL here, you'll see the tools that I'm gonna show in the next little section. We solve the problems I pointed out by having a a nice loader for the arguments by having a nice builder for those output types that GraphQL wants. And then some common types provided for us, like a timestamp that automatically serializes to ISO 8601. So first of all, let's look at the argument loader and open up the next example. We import that sugar library that I pointed out in a second, GraphQL sugar, like syntactic sugar. It makes sense. Um, and the first place we use it, I'll just highlight them, it's down here in the mutation where before we had that map saying, here's all the arguments that this resolver is going to take. Now we're going to build that dynamically by calling this ours config function from the sugar package and we pass it a struct instance. That struct has fields on it for all those GraphQL arguments we want. And then it's got struct tags saying, this is gonna be a GraphQL argument. In the GraphQL schema, it should be called ID. It's going to be required. <coughs> Somebody doesn't provide it, we're just gonna automatically return an error before our resolver even gets called. And it's gonna have this description attached. That also bubbles up all the way into that tooling where you can browse the documentation so this becomes a self-documenting API. We could do that in, in the vanilla framework as well. I haven't demonstrated it, but you can populate that from these struct tags. So that big map that was here is gonna be generated for us. Cool. The other thing where it's gonna, we're gonna use that struct is down here in the resolver. We're gonna use that same struct called sugar.loadargs on it and that's gonna go do all of that checking for each of those fields for us and populate it. This looks very much like just parsing JSON in Go. So it should be a fairly familiar pattern. But because we're using this same struct on both sides, both to generate the list of arguments we take and to parse them and convert them when they come in from the framework, we know we're always gonna be in sync. If we add another argument, we just add another field to this struct used on both sides, they're gonna agree. We get an error parsing it, we'll just return that. If not, we go ahead and create our new user. Um, so we've solved one of the things we hated. We still have some repetition in that we've got this user struct that has to agree with this user type. We don't have very strong guarantees on it. So, oh wait, I skipped ahead. There's one other nice thing in here. 
the Sugar Library gave us a free GraphQL type for timestamp. So I'm actually going to run this one. We had this query over in Insomnia doing a bunch of garbagey stuff, but we can just run it again and see ah, beautiful timestamps now. Everybody's going to know what that means. I'm not going to have to do fancy parsing like in the other one. So it gave us those two things. Um, I want to take a vote. Do you want to see the code for how that works? Or do you want to skip ahead to how to how it solves the object type thing? Second one. Second. Second, skip ahead. Let's do that. You can see how the reflection code works by going to this URL. Look at the type builder. It's going to be a very similar pattern. Here, sugar gives us <coughs> an output type call. We have to pass it a little bit more right now to tell it this is going to be the GraphQL type. It's going to have this description goes all the way out to the front end in the schema, in the tooling, the doc viewer, and all that, and build it off of this struct. That struct is down here. It's the same one we had, but it's got a little bit more because it already had JSON tags, and it's going to just use those for deciding what fields are in your return type. But because our inputs were mostly the same as our outputs, we're able to just put the, same, put the argument struct tags here on the same thing. So now, if, if, I, if I had pointed it out in the last example, it looked a little duplicative between the user struct that we're returning and the user input struct we were taking in to build the arguments. It's all just one struct now. And the only difference is this joined at field, which gets populated when you create the guy. That one doesn't have any arg tag, because you're not allowed to give that as an argument. So that gets omitted <coughs> when the arguments get built. Let's run that one. Graphical this time. Yeah, so if I jump down to the bottom, we're here and it's all saved user. We say we check our arguments, they check out, then we set the joined at, store it in the map, and we're all good. So our top level query type, all this is the same. We get back all of these fields, so our little description of the user type showing through, bubbling all the way up. So what have we done? We solved all three of those things that we hated. Come on, Kino, you're there. Why aren't you coming up? Oh, that's Zoom. <laughs> and we combined the input and output structs because had mostly the same fields, and we just use tags to differentiate them. <clears throat> we know now how to build a GraphQL server. What about a client? What if your Go app wants to talk to a GraphQL server? There are a few clients out there, not as many as on the server side. I just want to show one that we wrote to use at Nav. It is young. If you're interested in using it, talk to me first, because it's <laughs> sharp edges still, <coughs> and you would get cut. Um, I'm going to need a new tab for this. Uh, first, that over here, let's go ahead and go run that guy. And now, look at the last example. One I wrote is called Garfunkel. Credit to one of our other engineers. The name actually came before the project. <laughs> suggested that Garfunkel would be a cool name for something GraphQL related. And it's like, we got to make that a thing. <laughs> it exists now. Here's how you use it. You instantiate a client. You give it the URL of the GraphQL API. If you need to pass any extra headers, there's some options. You can pass in there any number of things that just can modify your client. So you can define your own, but there's some built-in ones for like setting a header. 
you build up the query, and this looks kind of shaped like the same things you've been seeing in graphical and insomnia, where there's a top level field called user. We need to pass it some arguments, so ID, Bob. Um, we're going to ask for some other fields coming back from inside that object. And the last thing is go specific. We want to scan all that into this other Bob object that's a user <laughs> at the end. So that uses just a JSON on Marshall into that. So if I run that, then we're going to just spew everything we get back. It goes and makes a query. It got that same data shape that you've seen in all the other examples. It unmarshaled it into the Bob guy. And now it's dumped it out. And you can see we got all that same data. The time.time field got automatically parsed, populated, turned into a real go time. We're not just getting like, like a string there. So this can handle any types you wanted to register, like a parser for any type you have on your structure could be parsed for you. Covered that. Sum up. I think GraphQL is a big improvement over what we had in REST. I like Go because it has static types. <clears throat> Give me assurance that my code actually does what it says it does. I can't have weird decouplings between parts of my program that think differently. GraphQL is similar. It's adding a type system to your API. Uh, the tooling in Go is not like you're going to get in JavaScript or Apollo client. It's just like amazing. It can all these cool things like stitching whole APIs together and making new ones. We don't have that yet. It's a little more tedious. Uh, GraphQL Go pretty good in the and let you build any GraphQL API you want. It just might be very verbose. But we have the tools to cut that down and build the framework that we wish we had for the app that we're building. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if you feel any pain with, with so many type systems, because you have GraphQL type system, and then you have your Go type system, and then maybe you have your SQL or Mongo or Mongo types. Um, does it get kind of repetitive? Well, it was repetitive until we used reflection to take away a lot of that go GraphQL work we had to do. Uh, where I find the biggest problem is not repetition, but in features that one type system has and another does not. So an example is that GraphQL has union types. So you could have a thing that's like, I'm going to get, let's say you had a search field and it's trying to be user friendly. So maybe it can return users and it can return businesses. Those are two different types. And so in the GraphQL API, you would say this search field <coughs> is user or business. You can express that very explicitly. That's really hard to do in Go. Go doesn't give you that option. Some other languages like a Haskell or something with algebraic data types would, would give you that. You can tell the GraphQL authors have been informed by some of those more powerful type systems. But if your GraphQL API exposes one of these more advanced types, it's harder to map to that in Go. We have to fall back to interfaces. And that's why the GraphQL Go library function on all of its resolvers is they return interface and error. Because it can't make any more strict guarantees than that. Like you could give it back anything coming out of your, your resolver function. Um, let's say that I'm really indecisive and I have like 2,000 favorite movies and I want to have a pagination feature for my query. Is that something that kind of thing? Or like if I want to get them in reverse order, stuff like that. Is that stuff that you can do inside of GraphQL? Yes. Um, on pagination, go to graphql.org. They have recommendations okay. for best practices. You could implement it any number of ways, but they've, well, they have three paragraphs on it. <laughs> Actually, I lie. There's a whole article here. <laughs> uh, on order, that would be pretty trivial. Uh, you can define as many arguments to your field as you want. They don't have to be required. So you could have one for order by. 
could have one for giving you every third thing, like it could be whatever you want at that layer. What is that arguing the other side? Yeah, let me add an argument to one of these and we'll check it out. Okay. So this is our final server side example, right? I want to go back one. Let's do the number two where args were separated out. <coughs> so if we just imagine save user one. We'll stick it up here. Here we have one argument when we ask for a user right now is ID. I could add another one. I could call it order by. Similar to the image of participant to the user. These are the arguments accepted by the user field. Um, so if I do that, and then I go over here, go um, samples oh, one. <coughs> go back to my graphical. That order by shows up as another argument I can provide to the user field. I can attach the order by to not the user, but the paper and the case is just simply is that not make sense? You absolutely can, because it's all just types and fields nested all the way down, right? So at the at the leaf node of our graph here, some raw stroke and automatic result for you. You don't have to like provide your own resolver function. But if you're building up like this whole kind of map yourself, you can add a resolve function and it could take like that field down in your tree could take its own set of arguments. Is there like a distinct like uh, parse and serialization like phase in the in the execution runtime? Yes, and the framework gives you some hooks for adding stuff to that. So GraphQL built in, it only has a few native types. There's scalars, which can be ints or strings. There's objects, that might actually be it. You can have lists of either of those. Um, you can define your own scalars. So like that timestamp one that Sugar gave to us. Uh, we can drill into that. We use create that with GraphQL.NewScaler and you pass it a configuration here for how everything works. You have to provide a few functions of how to serialize it, parse it. There's two different flavors of parsing depending on whether they query you with the raw query type or like the JSONified version. Uh, so you have to provide both of those functions. But you can absolutely like, declare your own types that get built into the schema. One other question: yeah. Is there anybody in Dolan trying to like use the GraphQL schema language for, you know, intro or I guess with well, not introspection um, reflection? So one of these frameworks, I can't remember which one it was, um, does have you start with like a big string. Yeah. That's your whole schema, and then it goes and parses that. <laughs> And I think it's one of the code gen ones. It like spits out a bunch of Go structs and functions for you that is your API. And then you just like go implement the guts of the resolvers. Um, so you can start at that end. That's also really common in the JavaScript world. Like the Apollo client has you start with the schema and you generate stuff from that. Yeah. I'm curious, are you only building internal APIs or public APIs? We have a public facing GraphQL API. I can show you what its docs look like. Um, there's a tool out there called GraphDoc that we just pointed at this API we had built. And it goes, inspects all the types, all the fields, everything, and creates some docs for you. And then we just added some narrative stuff uh, with markdown compiles and creates this home page. But um, like the API we use for partners to integrate with us, uh, started building last year and it's all GraphQL. I'm curious because they're in the podcast, um, somebody warned like with public APIs, it's like your users can do some wicked queries sometimes. Have you run into stuff like that? We haven't um, for two reasons. One, before you can start using this public API, you need to get a partner API key, pay us a bunch of money. And so 
miscreants tend not to do either of those things. Uh, the other is how deeply queries can go really depends on your own API design. And ours is pretty flat at this point. Uh, where you'd get into trouble is if you had a field like called friends that returned a list of people. And each person had another field called friends. Somebody could design a query that just drills really, 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 really deep and create a ton of work in your back end from just one round trip on the front. Um, we don't have any recursive relationships like that in our public API. So that's the biggest protection against that kind of misbehavior. Anything else? Pedro. So one of the advantages of these HTTP REST API is that since the responses typically always have the same structure, it's easy to cache. Yep. Right? So friend of Google is very easy. What are the challenges that you think someone would face if they would adopt GraphQL and using caching? So you're not going to be able to just like stick the varnish in front of it, have all your responses cached. Like that's out the window. Where you have to stick your caching is right behind your GraphQL API. So it'd be like a remca memcache or Redis, and that would be hit by your GraphQL layer, so it could avoid like expensive backend operations, but it would still have to cobble together the whole response and serve it back out. And how cumbersome do you think that would be? Since if you're returning a response that has different types, they only have different life cycles, right? So, which means why before I would get users ID one, right? And if every time I do an update on ID one, I could basically evict the cache for that one. If I'm not selling correctly your GraphQL, you can actually say, get me ID one, two, three, and basically get a response. But then, or even, you know, uh, user groups, something like that, and they all have different types of cache. Yeah, and I don't think you'd want to cache a whole response for that reason. You want to find grain to cache like a keyed by the user. There were two more hands. Well, I was going to say there, there are client libraries that do caching, um, like Apollo Client. Um, you can have some, you could move that caching to the client end if you wanted to. In the corner, big part of GraphQL, right, is decomposing your model and giving you a way of how to ask for your data that's client driven, right, but in a unified way that you can provide it from an API side, right? It's, Really nice from both sides as an API designer. You know, coming from the US world, I resisted it for a while. Right? It was like, oh, this is great. I don't have this big fire hose API anymore, right? Um, with that, you usually don't end up writing one endpoint where you put your cache and all your information, right? You build smaller pieces and then compose them into hard, you know, higher end components with resolvers pulled and that stuff. So the idea of sticking a cache out front, yeah, becomes um, less applicable for the free varnish way, but doing it in smaller, more modular ways where you actually need it becomes usually just a couple lines of code. So like the trade-off there is actually a lot nicer, even if it does move it into the developer core, right? And a keyword you mentioned there was compose. The way we're going at nav, the way I see Apollo, their server piece going, is that when you build one of these, it's not as you might be used to with like a Rails or a Django where it's all-inclusive framework and be your back end, your front end, and everything. Um, but the way that GraphQL and its resolvers work, I think it's much better as just a thin edge. And any services that are actually doing business logic, those are like other services running behind it <clears throat> that just get queried when a resolver needs to talk to them. Um, but trying to wrap all your business logic in the same API uh, feels like a bad way to go. Your, yeah, your resolver should be kind of like almost how some people do like MVC, right? Your controller shouldn't do the business logic itself. It should delegate out to a service tier. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is, if you look at GraphQL, GraphQL engine, no. So that's from, or Apollo engine, sorry, Apollo engine. It's from the Apollo guys, but it's like a server piece that they have, but um, apparently can do stuff with caching and whatever things you are using. Is that also the one that builds in the schema stitching? It's one we're excited about at NAV, where you could have like many different little GraphQL APIs inside your firewall. And it could talk to them, suck up their schemas, and build one big GraphQL API out of it. And in theory, it's really nice, but in practice, you're not there yet. You lose all your errors along the way. But, but yeah, it's kind of that whole suite of tools. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. The end of us with uh, like field level performance measurements uh, analytics is actually super helpful. You see like which fields and which query types are taking the long time. That's another lesson that we learned the hard way at NAV. Um, when you have a REST API, you take for granted that your logs are going to tell you a lot of stuff. Like they're going to tell you the path that the person hit and how long the request took. You can easily build analytics off of that. When all your requests are now just to slash GraphQL, your logs never, no longer tell you what the user was actually doing or asking for. So what we ended up building was little middlewares that wrap around all our resolvers and log out, okay, this is the resolver that's being called. These are the arguments that were given to it. Here's how long the request took um, that had to come inside the app. It's just a, an intermediate logging system was no longer informative enough. Yeah? Is, is there a sense of like middleware that you could apply like across the board for that sort of thing? Not at the way we were doing it because it was specific to this framework. Um, that would be an interesting problem to tackle. Yeah? Do you have any limitations for the middleware tag that's uh, identified by case of the best practice? Data lawyer pattern. Loader. Data loader pattern. That's better. All I've heard of a yeah, data lawyer. Um, <laughs> no. Is that a term more used more on the front end or the back? Back end. It separates the, the scheme and the resolvers from the data source. It allows you to clean caching layer in a place where you can abstract like your metric directly loaded into multiple facts and things like resolver aesthetics. I don't know that term. I remember reading about a project they wrote called Hackill or something like that, like a Haskell-based thing that was sounds very much like what you're describing, but I'm not any more familiar with it than that. All right, thank you guys. Hope this was interesting.